Well, I think the industrial, I, I think the, if you want to use two kinds of economic systems and jobs, it's good to think about pre-industrial pre society. In Europe, it was feudalism. Elsewhere, it was called something else. And the industrial system. And I think the most important reference for this is the industrial system, because the, the digital world, the network world, which Jonathan and I study and think about, um, is replacing that. So I think it's right to think in, if you like, Hegelian terms about the shift from an industrial world to the, um, the digital world. I mean, in terms of feudalism, there was no such thing as jobs. I mean, in, in, in pre-capitalist society, the idea even of a job didn't really exist. The notion of a market economy was barely in existence outside cities. So I'm not sure how relevant that is. In the industrial age, of course, jobs were, new kinds of jobs were created, jobs based on the market. So in the beginning of the industrial age, many of those jobs were appalling. You know, 11-year-olds working in factories, you just need to read Dickens and, uh, to, to understand that. Um, over the last 200 years, as the industrial system matured, both in economic, cultural, and above all else in political terms, many of those jobs became better. So I, I can't respond to that question. I think it's, uh, it depends when you look. If you look in the 1820s, if you look in 1811 when Lord Byron made, and, and Walter Isaacson in his excellent book, The Innovators, references this. If you looked in 1811 when, when, uh, when Lord Byron made his Luddite speech in the House of Lords, most jobs were appalling. Uh, and most of the jobs in the countryside were being destroyed. If you look, I don't know, in 1950 or 1960, at the height of the industrial age, which created a viable middle class, strong labor unions, strong firms, a good relationship overall between labor and capital, then I would argue absolutely, yes, technology can create very good jobs. John, I saw you taking notes. Do you want to? Yes, well, Andrew's answer was so um, nuanced and refined, it's hard to be like, how dare you, sir? <laughs> so it um, makes it hard to yeah, debate. Yeah. So instead, I'll probably more or less violently agree. Uh, but my sense is you posed the question to open us about whether the fact of the car displacing the teamster, the person who right, right. drives the buggy, and in back of that, the buggy whip maker, that's something I think most of us are reconciled to. I won't assume to speak for everyone, but that's seen as uh, maybe only belatedly as one of the worst possible things that could have happened as we look at the CO footprint and uh, CO2 and uh, the uh, Eisenhowerian uh, interstate system. But from a straight jobs perspective, technology itself refers to, from its root, technique, some practice that can be repeated and made so routine as to no longer require the judgment of a human to do. And we've come up with a lot of good techniques over the years that we then reify into an object that can do it. And when that happens, it calls to mind for me Isaac Asimov's quote that says, any job that a robot can perform is beneath the dignity of a human to do. Now, I'm not sure I agree with Isaac Asimov. There's plenty of stuff I still choose to do, like perhaps bake some bread. Now, maybe it pops out of a can at first, and then I just put it in the <laughs> oven. I should say prepare some bread. But even that is something now that could be done through technique and technology, but there might be some reason to do it. But to find myself having to earn my livelihood doing it and finding the result artisanally, it may turn out no better than what the technology can do, that does strike me as the kind of job that, of course, technology is designed to displace. And I wouldn't begrudge the person who's been relying on that job anxiety about losing it. But it confronts us not with the question of how do we keep the technology in the bottle, but how do we make sure that what the technology does is actually meaningfully of the same quality uh, as what came before, and that the person who might be displaced has a set of things that he or she can do to still find meaningful work. I think it's wrong to separate the technology from the culture. I mean, if you look at, in my book, I have two chapters, one on um, 
One on Rochester and Kodak, Kodak being the quintessential industrial company employed 150,000 people, workers, they, they, went to, they were paid cash, they went to factories, um, and they were paid cash for their product. Their products were then put on the market and sold in stores or as services. We all know what happened to Kodak a couple of years ago, essentially went bust. Kodak, in some ways, symbolically, the Kodak moment was replaced by the Instagram moment. The, 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 almost at the very moment that Kodak went bust, uh, Instagram was sold to Facebook for $2 billion. Oh, no, for a billion dollars, which at the time seemed a lot, and then WhatsApp came along and you know, was $20 billion, so a billion doesn't seem much, but it's still a lot, it's still a lot in my mind. Uh, I would take it. Um, here's the difference. Kodak employed 150,000 people. Instagram, when it was sold to Facebook, it employed 15, one five. It's shocking. David Brooks called it, uh, he wrote a column at the time, the moral crisis of capitalism. Now, that doesn't have anything to do with technology. The reason why Instagram was worth so much money was it operated on what's called a, a digital factory system. That's Mike Moritz's term, again, one of the most prominent Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. Instagram created the platform to enable all of us to put our photog photography online. And we all are working in Instagram for free. That's why Instagram only needed 15 people. Now, you can't blame the technology for that. The technology is a platform. The problem with, at least in that sense, the Instagram example or the Twitter example or the Facebook example or the Google example is that this free model it's turning us all into mugs. We're all producing this stuff for free. Whereas in the past, we were paid for our labor. I mean, it's the same with journalism and photography. So did the journalist trade, the photography trade, in some ways the musician trade, all these trades. Uh, uh, Jonathan Taplin's in the audience. He knows more about this than I do. These trades have been decimated, not by technology, though. I think it's all too easy to turn this into a debate about technology. It's a debate about economics and how we use our labor. So the problem in part in the digital economy is we've seen a shift from traditional factories where people were paid to, for, their, for their labor to a, a digital factory where we're, uh, which, is, which are open all the time where very few of us are paid and a tiny group of technologists are, um, are aggregating all the economic value. This is great. I think um, I found something to disagree with. Here. Good. <laughs> I, was, I was going along with Andrew, and then he took a, we might call a hard left turn uh, that I found hard to stay on the curve for. Um, it is striking that something like Instagram could be valued what it was valued. To immediately label that a problem, that they needed more employees in order to earn that valuation, seems we need to unpack that more to figure out why it would be a problem if it can be 15 people bless them would be the first uh, instinct. And I wouldn't have said that the fact that you don't get paid for sharing your own vacation photos with your friends, that would not strike me as the real, quote, problem of Instagram. The problem of Instagram, if there is one, is, wait a minute, why is that worth so much money when anybody, once the path has been shown, could come up with a system that lets you take a picture and share it. In fact, there's lots of ones we haven't heard of that before, during, and after Instagram do just that. And I think part of the answer is some of these technologies lend themselves to what we call network effects, where if it's tied to a social network, it's really hard to move to a new one. So goes the theory. And when that's the case, an Instagram can close the door behind it, and now it's the only way to share photos if you want to be able to have the rest of your friends see them. And I remember somebody saying, well, but yes, there's still Facebook. <laughs> it's like, that's like, yes, there's still VH1 if you don't like MTV. It's the same company behind it at the end of the day. That might be a real problem. And luckily, there are policy interventions that could make it so that if we want to share our photos, it's not we need to get paid to do it, but there need to be a multiple set of platforms uh, through which that can happen. I want to make one other point, too, that I, I don't know what Andrew would say to this, but another possible long-term drawback is what I would call tight coupling. The efficiencies are so good of something like Instagram, it'll work with six nines of reliability until the day that it doesn't. 
And for those of you that are huge users of any of these services and have invested a lot of your life in them, um, I remember the NBC special report that came up, that, like the Chiron said, Facebook is down. <laughs> it's like, that's why you're watching NBC. Um, and that moment where everything is so accessible until the instant that it isn't, there's a lot of slack built into the old Kodak system. You actually had your physical film. You had your negatives. You developed photos from the negatives. You could get duplicates, and they were tangible objects. For the long term, that might be something worth thinking about at the societal level. But otherwise, it's not clear to me that the, the fact that it's free is really the problem. So there's on the one hand, there's unemployment, and on the other hand, there's the kind of jobs that this new world is creating. Now, the unemployment thing we all know about, it's become increasingly uh, sort of, there's a, almost a hysteria in the culture about it, maybe an understandable hysteria. We have technology that replaces human labor. So leaving aside the Instagram example, um, the industrial age was based on two kinds of labor, expertise, middle class labor, the labor that enabled us to become doctors and lawyers, teachers, engineers. Um, and that was an expertise uh, based on a kind of meritocracy that we earned through universities. It was based on human intellectual labor. The other side of labor, of course, of the industrial age was physical labor the labor of the working class, what Marx called the proletariat. Um, this new technology, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, whatever you want, intelligent machines, whatever you want to call it, um, could theoretically replace both. I mean, is replacing both. A couple of economists at Oxford argued that 47% of jobs over the next 10 years, or five or 10 years, are going to be replaced. We're seeing algorithms efficient algorithms replace lawyers, doctors, teachers. We're seeing incredibly, increasingly networked intelligence replace those kind of meritocratic professions. And of course, we're seeing the emergence of a robot economy. Uh, Bezos, uh, Amazon invested in Kiva Systems, which is an automated system for managing warehouses. Uh, the, the company, the, the Chinese company that manufactures um, iPhones is committed to turning their factories, which were labor intensive, into uh, robot run factories uh, in, in, in Shenzhen, in China. Uh, my own sense is the real fear is less of manual labor. Uh, there's a kind of a, a robot economist, he's not a robot, but someone who, who's an expert on robots called Hans Morovich, a Czech who came up with something called the Morovich Paradox. And I think this is, a, this, is a, this is an important thing to bear in mind in terms of these debates. Morovich argued that the paradox about intelligent technology is actually, intelligent technology is more of a threat to what we think of as complex jobs, like lawyers and doctors and teachers, than the physical labor. So Tyler Cowen wrote a good book about this, Average is Over, in which he said there will be jobs in the future There'll always be the jobs at the high end, the technologists, the entrepreneurs. The middle class will be entirely decimated. And Cowan is, is a conservative, so he doesn't really have a, a political agenda here. And there'll be a low end of masseurs and gardeners and cooks. So those kind of jobs will exist. But I think the worst case scenario, or the nightmare scenario when it comes to uh, the, the, the future of jobs is the decimation of... Um, of, of skilled labor, of the, the, the sort of the backbone of our meritocratic order, the kind of audience. I mean, if I ask most of you, I'm sure most of you are trained in something. You went to university. You acquired skills to become a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer, a teacher. Those skills are, which were uh, very, very valuable for the last 100, 150 years, will become increasingly less valuable. It's not clear what you will do. It's not clear what will happen to that middle class. So the consequences in economic, but above all else in political terms, are dire. The second nightmare, and this is more real in the immediate sense, Marx, when he was talking about the future of the industrial age, he was, of course, utopian. He would have been on uh, Jonathan's side in this debate. <laughs> you see what he did there? Uh, uh, in his German ideology, he said, after capitalism, when technology frees us from jobs, we'll be free to be, I think, a poet in the morning, uh, 
uh, an author, a, a gardener in the afternoon and a cook in the evening, this idyllic notion of post-labor, post-jobs. And of course, what the sharing economy is doing is creating a world where, sure, we've all lost our, we're all losing our full-time jobs. It's harder and harder to get a job at a firm. It's indeed the, the, the old manual lifetime jobs are, are being undermined. And the reality is we're an Uber driver in the morning. We're selling our labor on task rabbits in the afternoon. And in the evening, we're renting out our spare room on Airbnb. So what we're seeing, the, and again, you can't think of this in technological terms. This is a political debate. But do we want that kind of uh, 1099 economy? Do we want an economy where everyone is perpetually selling their labor on these platforms and where all the value is, again, going to the platforms? Uber valued at 50 billion, Airbnb at 20 billion. So this isn't so much a debate about economics, but about politics. And that group of people has been called the precariat. Right, I, in my book, I, yeah, I, I wish I'd invented the term. <laughs> precariat as opposed to the proletariat. And the precariat, the word, of course, derived from precarious, meaning all labor will become increasingly precarious. Jonathan, you seem like you had a few spots you wanted to respond to there. Yeah, I uh, first wanted to just carry on Andrew's example of the poor vanishing lawyer a little bit. Um, <laughs> Are there any lawyers here, by the way? <laughs> one, one who would admit the it. The rest don't want to admit it, yes. Right. So, uh, and you teach law, so you, you know more about this than I I am exposed as a lawyer, it's true. Um, if I were to ask on the Bing Pulse, are there too many lawyers? <laughs> I don't know what the answer would be. Because in some respect, it sure seems like there are a lot of lawyers. And it calls to mind Douglas Adams' uh, Hitchhiker's Guide, where a planet needs to evacuate and it fills three spaceship arcs with its populace divided, just for ministerial purposes' sakes, into roughly the three zones that Andrew was talking about, the manual laborers and gardeners, the people who actually do things, um, the uh, people at the very top who are really hard to replace, and then the middle zone of, I think, what Douglas Adams described as real estate brokers <laughs> and lawyers. And the um, ship in the middle mysteriously got lost on the way to the new planet, and um, <laughs> things worked out happily ever after. Uh, retweet is not endorsement, I'm just saying. Um, now, there's another way in which there surely aren't enough lawyers. If you are renting out a small in-law apartment to somebody and that person declines to leave and to pay you, you're going to need a lawyer. And that's actually hard and expensive and difficult for you. And that person, if being unfairly kicked out, is going to need a lawyer. And it's really hard. And there aren't a lot of them, et cetera, et cetera. If there were a way to actually settle between the two of them what the state of the law is so they actually appreciated what their rights were and could have their dispute resolved, whether or not both are happy, under the principles of law consistently without needing the huge amounts of manual labor and paperwork that currently prevail, all right, that would be great. And it, before that, at least, there aren't enough lawyers to be able to make that efficiently resolved. Great for who? I think it would be great for the parties great for the people. Now, not great for the lawyer that would like to have a job dealing with the paperwork any more than it's not great for the buggy whip maker to have the car. Now, I know you're going to insist, wait, you're still making it about technology. But um, to me, if you can find, I hate to use the word efficiencies because it masks just how rich what we can find is. But if you find efficiencies, yes, society then faces a question of, We've just discovered way more abundance. How might we share it once it has been discovered? And that is a question that should be done with the idea of the dignity of everybody in society being met while still incenting the right kinds of work to get stuff done that people need to do. And if, if AI gets really good at certain niche things, which is how it's going to happen, it's right. not right. like we're going right. to get a general purpose AI right. running around anytime soon. The only worry, again, would be what I put as a tight coupling concern, which is the AI will just render decisions. It may not even be ex able to explain how it came to the decision. It's like, no, no, you win, you lose. Trust me. All right, I'm not sure I would trust it forever. Um, but what we can automate, ideally, we would if there's no reduction in quality, and then let people like hipsters choose to brew their own beer three <laughs> bottles at a time because it's something fun for them to do. And but, I just want to say one other quick thing yeah. about the 
terror of Ubering in the morning and task rabbiting in the afternoon, or for a lawyer who's ever double billed, maybe you could be carrying a package while Ubering somebody. <laughs> and there, there is a certain feeling of like living at the edge to it, that you're just pulling for scraps. There's another sense in which, wow, I have more than one entity willing to push me money to do something. So if I'm not happy with one, I can go to another. And I just took an Uber uh, in San Francisco the other day, and the guy can reprogram. He showed me how he would do it, his phone to become a Lyft driver. I don't know if he actually has to manhandle the mustache onto the car and <laughs> off each time, but surely that could be automated. And that provides a form of competition that it's true, it's gonna be really hard to unionize the Lyft drivers, but if they can all vote with their wheels and move to Uber or move from Uber to Lyft or move from Lyft to TaskRabbit, that would address many of the concerns that Andrew and, and I and others have without having to try to put a spanner in the works of the whole thing. The thing about um, Uber, of course, and, and Lyft and the rest of the sharing economy is there's currently, a, and, and you again probably know more about this, I mean, there's a, currently a great legal debate about what kinds of mm -hmm. obligations these companies should have for their workers. Yes. Or for, whether these so-called workers are workers, whether they're yes. independent agents. So I'm not against the sharing economy, providing, provided these companies recognize that they do have both an economic and perhaps even a moral obligation yes. to the people who work on their platforms. Uber presents themselves as a platform, not a company. I think for this economy to become not only viable, but decent, they have to think of themselves as a company rather than a well, platform. Well, now we're in violent agreement again, and I don't oh, think dear. we should have to face what? a dichotomy between are you a 1099, good luck with your life contractor, right. or are you a full-fledged employee right. with the entire, I mean, this well, is Well, let's be in violent disagreement then. Jonathan managed to annoy me by, finally, by raising the A word, one of the most appalling words, I think, in this whole debate, abundance. Whenever I hear <laughs> that word, it makes me cringe. Um, because, of course, there is no such thing as abundance. In economic terms, there is always abundancy and scarcity. There's always new kinds of scarcities. In this new economy, the scarcities are of time, of reputation. And maybe, again, I'm being unfair on Jonathan, but there are theorists of abundance like Peter Diamantis and Singularity University and Kurzweil and all these people who, sit, who seem to think that this technology will create this new abundance, abundance of opportunity, abundance of time, abundance of freedom. I think the example that Jonathan gave is not a compelling one. So we'll be free to, in hipster terms, brew our own beer. We were told in the 1990s with the media revolution, we would be free to write our own music, free to write our own blogs, free to take our own photographs. We, we had this theory of Chris Anderson. We don't hear about that very much anymore. The long tail. The idea of a cottage economy of hipsters all being creative and making money. Now, you know more about the media business than I do. That hasn't happened. And the problem with this idea of abundance is, sure, everyone's free. And if you've made a lot of money in software, you're free to brew your own beer. You're free to, to write your own music. You're free to take your own photographs. But the, f the real issue here is not freedom. The real issue here is being able to uh, find something which generates the revenue to support yourself and your family. And the, the hipster model of the time to brew your own beer doesn't work. It, doesn't, it hasn't worked over yeah, the last 25 yeah. years in digital history, and yeah. I fear it will work even less in the future. The, the, the forces of late capitalism, whatever you want to call it, that are creating the inequality, the stuff that people like Piketty write about, Krugman, all the rest yeah. of them, are played out yeah. in an even more exaggerated way through, as Jonathan said, the network effects. So w what you're seeing is this technology creating uh, a tinier and tinier group of winners. You see it in the digital economy. You will see it with these platforms. And in terms of labor and jobs, I think it's bad news for the old middle class. Well, that's absolutely why it's worth spending a beat on network effects and how an economy that really wants to succeed and a society that wants to succeed doesn't unduly allow them to have their runaway effects. 
because let's be clear, if you're a prisoner to network effects, you're staying on that service because that's where your friends are. It means the service can get lazy and give you worse quality and you still won't leave. That's not good for anybody. They should feel somebody breathing down uh, their neck. But I also don't want us to over romanticize the situation of 1994. If you were a musician in 1994 looking to have your talent recognized and make it big, it was not some nirvana of like, well, just go to the street corner and play and soon someone will come along and offer you a contract with very generous terms. I mean, Rod Stewart is doing his best to wiggle out of the contracts he signed 35 years ago under a provision in American law that says actually exactly 35 years after you signed a music contract, you can get out of it if you fill out the right paperwork at the right time. A provision detested by the music industry. They've had it in for this uh, provision. So 1994 wasn't ideal. The only ideal we might point to in the realm of news in particular, and it's not just thinking of news as an industry in which to make money, but a vital fourth estate for society, was that television programs through government mandate had to devote some of their programming to public interest and news, completely cross-subsidized by Scooby-Doo, and newspapers, for whatever reasons, did the same thing through classified but, advertising. But let, let's take the example of, and you're right, I mean, I'm not, I'm the last person to defend the labels. No one's, no one's gonna defend the labels. Well, Jonathan Taplin might, Jonathan and you can Taplin hear might. his talk at 7.45 <laughs> a.m. tomorrow. Look for it on your schedule. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so I'm not here to defend the labels, and, and, you, and you're right, you know, the labels weren't, weren't exemplary, and, and no one's arguing that the old system was ideal. The old industrial system was far from ideal. This is not a debate about one utopia versus another. It's a debate about two working systems, one that worked in some ways in terms of creating jobs, and one that I'm worried won't. Uh, but when it comes to the recorded music industry, since 1999 with Napster, 50% of the global revenue of the, music, the recorded music industry has gone away. Now, the impact of that on real jobs, not on the labels, not on guys running around in limousines in, in, in Los Angeles, on people who work in record stores, in people who worked at the labels, which barely exist anymore, uh, the, the people who truck the CDs from the... I think you're in Crimea River territory. I mean, yes, I feel bad for the people who yeah, but truck CDs. where are the CDs. new jobs? Where are the new jobs? I would love to find them, but they, they shouldn't they be in exist. continuing to truck CDs so that they are not dispossessed of that job. Okay, I agree. I'm not idealizing the job of the trucker who, 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 who ships CDs. But the problem with this technological revolution is... And you're right. Old job that no one has any right to a job, and no industry has any right to a, uh, to, to the continuing. Or at least exist. a job doing a particular. Yeah, thing. I mean, every every the, the nature of technology, as, as Schumpeter understood, lends itself to permanent destruction. But the problem is that these old jobs are going away, and there doesn't seem to be any new jobs. Give it to the us. happiest scenario I can think of has to do with something Andrew was mentioning, which was to what extent do you need a platform to undertake your job? Because if you do need the platform, the platform is gonna take a cut. And in fact, if it's a platform everybody uses and is hard to leave on both sides, customer and supplier, it's gonna take an ever-increasing big cut. So that's what we want to avoid. Now, there are platforms that I would call unowned owned and unowned platforms. And they are illustrated so nicely in the sweep of technology from 1994 onwards as the internet went mainstream. I'll bet a lot of us still use email in the sense that we delete spam every so often that didn't get caught by the spam filter. Email is an unowned technology in the sense that there is no company called Email Inc. There is no material patent over how it operates. There's no CEO of email. There's no customer service line to call about email. It is a collective hallucination that says you can set up a server and you can talk to any other email server and exchange email. That makes it really hard to take a percentage out. In fact, so hard, it's why it is profitable for a spammer to send five billion emails and not even bother to check the spelling because they can send out another billion 10 minutes later. Okay, that's a really interesting economic, among other things, arrangement, and it's not just email. 
The internet is a collective hallucination platform that lets anybody build upon it with no CEO and no main menu. When you log onto the internet, you get a blinking cursor in effect that's like, don't ask me for content, I'm the internet. Go find somebody else on the internet that has content. It didn't have to be that way. It could have been just CompuServe or AOL version 2.0, and it wasn't. So I think it is fair to ask now for the stuff we're talking about that's starting to have bite in the real world, like trucking, like music, what would an unowned platform look like there, even as the current unowned platforms are all becoming owned? More and more, I'm sending somebody a direct message on Twitter, a Facebook message. There are CEOs and customer service lines for all of those. And what that might like look like, I would take OpenTable as an example, because OpenTable is a poster child for all the things that Andrew and others, including me, worry about. Open table was, we'll come into your restaurant, maybe it'll be a loss leader, we'll set up, we'll give you this free PC that says open table on it at the kiosk. People can make reservations, it'll manage everything for you. And then five years later, ask the restaurateurs, I have yet to find one that likes open table. Apologies if the CEO of open table is here right now, <laughs> and you should have a moment to defend why all restaurateurs hate you. But the, the reason is quite clear. It's because now that Everybody uses OpenTable to get a reservation, and if you're a restaurant needing reservations, you're gonna use OpenTable. OpenTable has ground you down to the like marginal 10 cents you're gonna make on that particular table, which is better than zero. That didn't have to be that way. First of all, you could imagine a competing set of reservation platforms, each of which then, like ideally Uber and Lyft, would compete for restaurants' attention, and maybe you could even repurpose that hardware, so you don't have to make a big investment to move from one to the other. That could still potentially happen, and the law could help it if OpenTable has contractual terms that say if you use us, you have to agree you won't use anyone else. Strike that down, let competition reign. But let's also quickly look at the unowned alternative. On the semantic web that Tim Berners-Lee invented, you could actually have a restaurant simply offer up on the web on a machine-readable page, here are the tables available and at what times. And anybody could write an app that would scrape that page and then send a note to the restaurant that says, I want this table at this time. You could do all of the functionality on an unowned platform that would then not take a cut at all. And I would love to see more attention given to those possibilities. And I really believe it is mostly a failure of imagination and, of course, a failure to capture profits that stops people from thinking big and doing platforms like that. So I think this is a really important issue. And in a way, I agree with Jonathan, and in a great way, I disagree. The history of the internet, as, as, as he explained, is that the, the early history, the first history, from the post-war, from uh, to the period just after the First World War, up until about 19, uh, 1991, 92, was of a publicly owned industry. And email was a technology, a product, that was created off that. Since then, we've had an increasingly privatized, commercialized platform, beginning, of course, with Netscape. Uh, Netscape was the kind of the transitional product that went from Tim Berners-Lee's open, non-profit browser technology of the World Wide Web to something that was privatized uh, to company, you know, to these dominant platforms today. So his, his reading is right, but he's unrealistic. That's the problem. What, what Jonathan is saying is, let's go back to the early days of the internet. Let's go back to the nonprofit days. Let's go back to the, the age where we had email, and it came out of the University of California, or it came out of RAND, or it came out of some think tank in, in Washington that was funded by government. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. We cannot go back. And in to fairness, the you're looking for the good old days of Geffen Records. Well, no, well but I'm pointing out something in terms of jobs. What I think the reality of, of what you're talking about is rather than going back, there needs to be a political role. We've, we've gone through what Obama called the wild, wild, the wild, 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 wild west period of the internet, which was really between about 89, uh, you know, 1991 and today. And it's clear that most of these, many of these companies and platforms have a tendency towards monopoly and exploitation from Google to Uber to Facebook when it comes to our data, when it comes to how they treat their workers and, and so on and so forth. So the real issue is rather than going back to some 
technology utopia, some no place. Uh, <laughs> the reality is that this is now not an issue of technology, it's an issue of politics. And the same was true in the industrial age. The technology that created jobs and destroyed jobs was the same as the technology today. It's just technology. The challenge is a political one. So at the beginning of the industrial age, technology decimated labor and was deeply exploitative. It took 100 years of political action to create the dignity of labor, to create laws which enabled unions. Now, we can't go back to that. I don't know what the equivalent of unions or even jobs will be in the 21st century. But these are political issues. They're not technological issues. And we can't go back to an earlier idyllic period pre-commercial period of technology, because Silicon Valley and the VCs won't allow us to do that. 